Thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning. Our guest today for pre-worship enrichment is David Lamott, hailing us from North Carolina. Go ahead, David. Morning, friends. I am um, honored and delighted to be with you this morning. I am a member of the Swannanoa Valley Friends Meeting in Black Mountain, North Carolina, and I am uh, a convinced friend. I, I'm not a birthright friend. Um, I've been hanging out with the Quakers for 30 some years, I reckon, and it's a it's it's become home to me. I was chewing on what to talk with you about this morning, and I, I decided to just tell you a little bit of a story about my little town and about um, some things that happened here and, and how my family decided to respond. My, uh, I, I, I moved, actually, my family moved about three years ago. We moved one mile from a 875-square-foot house with one bathroom to um, a slightly larger house so that my father-in-law could move in with us. He was in failing health and it was time for him to move in. And my uh, son was quickly becoming a teenager and we came to the conclusion that more than one bathroom might be a good idea and we found a way to make that work. And so we moved and we only moved one mile from our old house to our new house. That old house I lived in for about 25 years, which was long enough to watch my neighborhood change quite a lot. Over those years, um, a whole lot of different things happened in that neighborhood, but one of the most significant was that one day the town came and put a sidewalk in. Before the sidewalk, it was a busy road. It was It's still a busy road, but it was the kind of neighborhood where people pull into their driveways and they might know the neighbors on either side, but they probably don't know the neighbors even two houses away. So it was a collection of houses, but it wasn't exactly a neighborhood in the way that I think of a neighborhood existing. And when the town came and put that sidewalk in, I was amazed at the change that happened in our neighborhood, that people over the next year or two, people started using that sidewalk and walking down to the little lake a couple of blocks away or walking to the grocery store or walking their dogs or pushing their babies in strollers. And people would see each other on the sidewalk and they would nod hello a few times and then Maybe the fourth or fifth time they'd say, so I, I, I've seen you several times here. I live on the corner. Where do you live? And and people would chat about pleasantries and small things. And over time, there were tiny threads of community that were woven in the neighborhood. And it really changed the way my neighborhood felt to me. I felt like it was more of a, of a rooted and connected place. And I was so happy to see that happen. I think that community is kind of the heart of all of it. And it was beautiful to see these connections across a lot of lines that can, se that, that can separate people, including lines of politics and income and skin tone and orientation and many, many other things. Um, ability. There was a, a couple that were both sight impaired living across the street and um, some fairly large homes and some small trailers. And, um, and people began to know each other. And I find that that matters on so many levels, but one of them is that when things go wrong, there's a little bit of relationship to lean into there. When somebody's tree falls in somebody else's yard or somebody's dog is driving everybody crazy, you have a little bit of relationship. You know, oh, I see you on the sidewalk from time to time and um, I just want to check in about this. And that really changes the conversation rather than a complete stranger knocking on your door with something difficult to talk about. So those light connections really matter, um, not just the deep connections between friends, it seems to me, or between neighbors, rather. So I don't know if you all recall, but back in 2016, there was this election, this national election. And people suddenly were afraid to talk to each other again. I almost felt like the town had come and ripped out the sidewalks. When Donald Trump was elected as president of the United States, there were people in my neighborhood who were very happy about that. And there were people in my neighborhood who were horrified and scared. And people didn't necessarily know which people were which. And so people were kind of afraid to talk to each other for fear of offending or fear of not feeling safe. And that broke my heart. 
Of course, there were lots of things that broke my heart in that era, but this loss of a sense of community in my own neighborhood was a difficult thing. And one night I was at the dinner table with my wife and my son. My son was then seven years old. And I said, you know, I I just wish somebody would make a sign that says, you know, if your car battery is dead, you can knock on my door no matter who you voted for, and I will happily give you a jump. And then I realized I had said those magic words, somebody oughta which is an always, uh, it's always a dangerous thing to hear yourself say because it means that, um, you know, well, you remember very quickly that you are somebody. And I remembered that I not only am somebody and could make such a sign, but I actually um, knew how to have signs made. I'm a professional musician, and from time to time I have to have signs made for various events, and I, I knew about that. And so I thought, well, I probably should make some kind of sign. And so I sat with my family, and we uh, discussed if we were to put a sign in our front yard or on the house, um, what would it say? And my seven-year-old and my wife and I kicked around the, the, the words that we would put on such a sign. And we finally came up with the ones that are on the sign back there over my shoulder. And it says this. I'm going to turn around so I get it just right. You are our neighbors. No matter who you vote for, your skin color, where you're from, your faith, or who you love, we will try to be here for you. That's what community means. Let's be neighbors. And on Christmas Eve of 2016, my son and I took a little stepladder out to the front of the house, and we nailed that sign to our house, a a bigger version of it, three feet wide and eight feet tall. We nailed it to the front of my house, to our house, I should say. And it hung there for many years until we moved. And it was wild to watch the the conversations that happened because of the sign and how people responded to it. And folks would pull in the driveway and they would take pictures of it and they would knock on the door and want to talk about it. And I was deeply grateful for that. I need to point out, though, that the sign doesn't say, no matter all these things, everything's cool. Making peace is not making nice. And people live and die by our, our voting decisions, right? Our governmental decisions. And so it's not saying, let's just pretend everything's okay. It is saying, we will try to be here for you. That's how it ends, right? Because I do believe that relationship predates transformation for all of us. We can't demand that people are transformed into the people they want to that we want them to be in order to be in relationship it is the being in relationship that changes all of us and rehumanizes people across the lines and that's where the hope lies for me is in rehumanization rather than dehumanization and so i um i feel good about that statement after all these years and it's uh, still one that i stand behind Um, I literally slept behind it at the old house, and that worried my son a little bit. We live in a small southern town. If someone had taken a shot at that sign, it would have come right through the wall to our bed. Um, So it's it's something that I don't take lightly, standing behind that sign. But I, I believe that people are very seldom rejected into making more compassionate decisions. First, we love. Love turns out to be the most pragmatic approach we can take. That's what I believe at any rate. So here we are in an even more polarized time. That polarization has not reduced since 2016. It has gotten greater. And I think it's important to stand in the way, as Quakers have a long history of doing, of oppression and injustice. And I think it's important to do that in love. It could be very hard to reconcile those things. But Anyone who has ever loved an addict knows that sometimes the best way to love someone is to stand directly in front of their intentions and block them. How do we do that in love? So that's the query that I'm bringing to you this morning and to myself. How do I stand for what I believe, sometimes against the wishes of people I love, and do that in love? 
That for me these days is perhaps the hardest question, and it's the one I'm sitting with. So I'll leave it there with y'all. Um, y'all is second person plural, just to clarify. Being a Southerner, I'll just tell you about that. But if you have uh, thoughts to share or questions for me, I, we can use these last couple of minutes that way. Again, I'm grateful to be with you this morning. I have one request, David, and that is yeah. uh, during the early part of worship, would you please repeat the query one more time for sure. our people who are joining a little bit later and to remind us so we can mm -hmm. more easily carry that with us in worship? Happy to do that. Well, I am a professional musician, and I could um, offer you a song to close, a, a very short one, perhaps, to, to take us into worship, if that would be all right. That would be um, great. And I will say, um, because I used the word professional there, that sounded a little funny to my ears when it came out. Um, I think the, the, word profession, the words professional and amateur are largely misunderstood. Um, a professional is just that which you profess. When somebody asks you who you are, what you do, your answer is your profession. It has nothing to do with accounting. And um, amateur, of course, is a lover, one who loves in the French. Um, and so, regardless of whether we are professionals or not, may we always be amateurs. Here's a song I didn't write. Um, Sibelius and Lloyd Stone wrote it before I could get around to it. <clears throat> this is my song, O oh God of all the nations, a song of peace for lands afar and mine. This is my home, the country where my heart is. Here are my hopes, my dreams, my holy shrine. But other hearts in other lands are beating with hopes and dreams as true and high as mine. My country skies are bluer than the ocean, and sunlight beams on clover leaf and pine. But other lands have sunlight too, and clover, and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. This is my song, O God of all the nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. Thank you, David. That was wonderful. Thank you, friends. Let's listen for what the Spirit may be saying to us this morning in the still small voice that we have come to recognize. <clears throat> 